You're going to be sitting here with your eyes closed for an hour. So try to make it a pleasant experience. Take a couple of good, long, deep in and out breaths, and ask yourself where in that process of breathing is a potential for ease, pleasure, a sense of fullness in the body. If there doesn't seem to be much pleasure just yet, focus on the parts that are okay. But don't think that they have to stay just that way. Learn how to develop the potentials you have here, because the breath does have a lot of potentials. You'll find that the use of your perceptions will make a big difference. How you visualize the breath to yourself, how you pay attention to the different parts of the body, how you react to the parts of the body where there are patterns of tension. Can you focus on them in a way that begins to disperse the tension? Can you spread your awareness around so that it envelops the body? And dissolves away any bits of tension here and there that otherwise would stay there because you're not aware of them or you're not paying attention to them. And John Lee talks about the breath being the medium by which the medicine of alertness and mindfulness can make a difference in how you're feeling your body right now. Because that's one of the big lessons in concentration practice. One of the most important lessons is that you can change things. Think about how John Lee discovered this method. He'd gone into the forest, walked for three days to this very out-of-the-way place. They were going to be depending on a hill tribe village for their alms. He was going to spend the rains retreat there. Well, a few days after he arrived, he had a heart attack. And as he said, he was ready to die if he had to. But he wanted a sign. Was there a possibility that he might survive? And there were a couple of signs that indicated, yes, he could. And so he set about to see what he had. He didn't have much. The diet there, from the point of view of Thai medicine, was really bad for the heart. A lot of bamboo shoots. In Thai medicine, the heart attacks are basically considered as a disease of the wind element, and bamboo shoots are bad for the wind element. So his food wasn't going to be his salvation. He realized he was going to have to work on the wind element from within. So he'd already seen some yogis in India. Notice how they use their wind element, breath element, in their bodies to stand in single positions for long periods of time out under the sun. He learned a little bit about that. Now he's going to explore it even further. And so that's how he pulled himself together. He looked at the potentials that he had, saw what he could do with them. And as a result, at the end of the rains retreat, he was able to walk out three days to get back to civilization. He lived for another eight years. So he didn't just say, well, this is what a heart attack is like. He didn't tell himself that the desire for things to be different was bad. He just wanted to explore what are the potentials here, see how far they can go. This is why we have method two, the keeping the breath in mind. In that passage in there where he talks about how when you're working on concentration, you're taking what is inconstant and trying to make it constant. You're taking what is stressful and trying to make it easeful. And you're trying to take what is not under your control and see how far you can control it. You push against those three perceptions. And in doing so, you create a path. This is how the path works in general. You don't start with equanimity. 
you start with the principle of action, that your actions can make a difference. Back in medieval India, when they introduced the Four Noble Truths in the basic textbooks they had for Buddhist doctrine, they would start with the five aggregates and move quickly to the three characteristics, then get to the Four Noble Truths. In other words, start with a picture of reality. And the message of the picture of reality is that reality is pretty much out of your control. It's not worthwhile to try to exert control over it. And that attitude has permeated a lot of Buddhist practice ever since. Because you notice when the Buddha introduced the Four Noble Truths, he didn't start with the principle of reality. In fact, there are passages in the canon where they make fun of teachers who, when you ask them a question, will start with how many elements there are in the world, whether good and bad are social conventions or, or not. But it's basically a picture of reality, and then from that picture of reality, all too often the message was, Human action is totally powerless. The Buddha, though, started with the power of human action. His graduated discourse starts not with principles of reality, but with actions. He talks about generosity, he talks about virtue, and the good that can come from doing these things, how you can make your life a better life when you practice these things. Of course, he's going to get to the point where the good of just virtue and generosity has its limitations. But again, he doesn't tell you to just give up on action. He then teaches you the Four Noble Truths, and the most important part of the Four Noble Truths is the, the path, a path of action that will lead to the end of action. But it is a path of action. It's instructions on how you make things better, how you take that desire for things to be different, and you don't snuff it out. You train it. You realize that simply wishing for things to be different is not going to get you there. That is one of the definitions of suffering, with not getting what you want, in other words, being born and not wanting to die. You can't get that simply by wishing. But there is that path, the path of virtue, the path of concentration, the path of discernment. That will get you where you want to go, take you to a different place from where you are right now. So what's important is that you can make a difference, and you shouldn't try to deny your desire to make a difference or for things to be different. Simply learn how to train that desire. After all, that kind of desire is one of the basis of success. It's part of right effort. And with each of these skills that you learn on the path, you find that you can really make a difference. Now again, you do run into limitations. And John Lee couldn't make himself live forever. During those eight years, he had heart trouble again and again. But for eight years, he was able to pull himself together. There came a point, though, where he couldn't. But then he had other things that were more important that he could do. Which means when you start thinking about equanimity, remember the Buddhist pattern for teaching equanimity. You don't just go straight to equanimity. Those different lists that talk about developing equanimity, you develop equanimity through insight, you develop equanimity through concentration, you develop equanimity as part of the Brahma Viharas. Equanimity comes after you've made a difference in your mind, after you've found a sense of well-being, that potential for well-being in each of those activities. The equanimity of insight comes after the joy of insight. You gain insight into things that have been burdening the mind. And you realize that you don't have to carry those burdens. There's a joy that comes with that. The equanimity of concentration. First you go through the first and second and third jhanas. Rapture, pleasure. More rapture, more pleasure, pleasure. It gets more and more refined. The Brahma Viharas, the sense of well being that comes from goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, when you realize that you don't mean ill to anybody at all. It 
your heart is wide. You have compassion for all beings, including those who have harmed you. You have empathetic joy for others, no sense of narrow resentment. The heart gets more and more expansive. Then you develop equanimity, because after all, no matter how much you wish for all beings to be happy, it's not going to happen. There does come a point where you have to say, well, that's as far as I can go in that direction. But you've gone far already. And the same with the practice of concentration. You stop the direct thought and evaluation when you realize that no matter how much more you talk to yourself about the breath, it's not going to get any better. It's good enough as it is, so you settle in. Then you find that the rapture that comes from settling in like that, that becomes oppressive. You want something that's better, something more refined. So you drop that rapture. You get the mind to just the pleasure of the concentrated mind, the pleasure in the body, equanimity in the mind. And then you find that even this need to breathe in and breathe out feels oppressive. Your sensitivities have gotten heightened at that point. So you allow the body to be there, and it's because your awareness fills the body and the mind is very still. It doesn't need to breathe. You don't have to force it. So you come to equanimity with a sense of fullness. If you go straight to equanimity before you've done anything, it becomes defeatist. Equanimity has to follow on joy, for it to be the large-hearted equanimity that is a good part of the path. And you see that it, too, has its limitations. This has been the pattern all along. You saw the limitations of generosity and virtue. Now you begin to see the limitations of concentration. Now if things stop there, it would be like the serenity prayer. I have the courage to change what I can change, the patience to accept what I can't, and the wisdom to tell the difference. But there's more. When you take the powers of discernment that you've developed as you've been getting the mind to settle down, and you gain an understanding of the mind, it's tendency to run off to hindrances, and how you can put a stop to that tendency, and all the processes that go into creating this state of concentration, developing the potentials that you have in the breath, in the body, in the mind, in your perceptions, you begin to see, well, this too is fabricated. This too has its limitations. Is there something better? And the Buddha's answer is yes. And you find that opportunity within yourself. That's when you realize like, it's not just running up to limit limitations and accepting them. You've seen where the limitations are everywhere else in the world. And that funnels your interest into the deathless. Because the mind seems to want to do anything else, go anywhere else but to the deathless. So you've got to show it. Well, there's going to be limitations no matter where you go. Even the good things you do with generosity, virtue, concentration. They have their limitations. Maybe it's time that you opened up to the possibility of something better. So the Buddha is steering you in this direction. You learn to accept the limitations because you're going to go to some place that's unlimited. So that's the message from the beginning all the way through the end. Is the power of your action, the power of human action, based on that desire for things to be different. You don't snuff out the desire, you don't deny it. You learn how to make it skillful. You learn how to focus it on skillful actions, and you pursue the different skills of generosity, virtue, concentration, discernment, to see how far they can take you. And like that image of the chariots, the relay chariots, 
the first one can't take you all the way, but it can deliver you to the next one, which can take you further, which can deliver you to the next one, take you further. And you don't stop with equanimity. You see that it too is fabricated, there must be something better. You think the chariot that takes you to where you want to go, a place with no limitations at all. It's the end of desire, it's the end of wanting things to be different. Not because you've told yourself that it's a bad desire, but because you've gotten to a place that is totally satisfactory. I saw recently someone quoting a John Mahabur saying that Nibbana is a place of enough, and their idea was that they were going to teach people to have a sense of enough that would take them to Nibbana right now. That's not what it is all about. You get to Nibbana. Things are enough because they really are enough. You've made a difference. And you've seen how far desire can take you. It can deliver you to the threshold of where you want to go. So don't look down on desire. That was another one of John Lee's lessons. It's because of our desire to practice, our desire for true happiness, that we're going to be able to find it. Just take that desire seriously. It was going to require skill. But they are skills that we can all develop.